Hello and welcome to a conversation with Dave Lee. Dave is very active on the Festival 23 scene, a leading light with the illuminator Fanataros and an occult author as well as being a rune master. Welcome Dave. Thank you, it's good to be here. It's fantastic to see you again. So Dave, could you tell us a bit about how you first became interested in runes? Well, that's kind of like, um, that's kind of in a way a long story that's tied up with my own magical development. Um, I came into magic uh, uh, of any sort really, well into magical practice uh, via chaos magic um, way back in the late 70s and um, I, uh, it was necessary, chaos magic was really necessary and useful for me because I was a science kid and so I was still kind of like tainted with scientism, you know, the religion of this age and I, in order to get out of that I needed to prove to myself that that scientism could not embrace my own experience. In other words, I had to have miraculous experiences and I had a few of those in my youth, but uh, I wanted to make that more a part of my life. So I started practicing chaos magic and I had more miraculous experiences and I succeeded in gradually sort of detaching myself from the, the morass of scientism into, a, you know, into a multi-model view of the world. The downside that some people identify with chaos magic, and there's a group, certainly more than a small grain of truth in this, is that if, if practiced exclusively, it can lead to a kind of shallowness where you're just paradigm hopping. You just sort of like, you know, oh, okay, I'll dress up as an Egyptian today and do this ritual, you know, dress up Celtic tomorrow and do that ritual. This is good. This is how you begin your magical process, I think. Understanding what traditions and aesthetics work for you under, under what circumstances, understanding how to shift belief, understanding how to get results um, using a, you know, using a pick and mix approach. But ultimately that's kind of a bit unsatisfying. It can lead to a kind of almost like a kind of spiritual materialism, a sort of, uh, oh, well, it doesn't matter as long as we're getting results, nothing else matters. And so you just end up kind of graying out into the usual bourgeois reality of just wanting more stuff. Um, so I wanted to, so that approach to chaos magic didn't entirely satisfy me and I wanted the other half of my journey to sort of to, to, artic to, to be articulated better. I wanted the other side of me that, what, that was interested in magic wanted something that was truly initiatory, something that's from outside of myself that that was that was an actual tradition that I could immerse myself in and learn deeply. So after about probably I suppose 15 years of practicing chaos magic and really that was it, um, I started looking around and the systems that I'd worked with I, I was particularly fond of and had a particular resonance with were the I Ching and Taoist alchemy, um, Tantra, and also Voudon to a certain extent. But um, all of these are, are schemes where you need to be part of an initiatic lineage and in order to get the best out of it you need to learn another language. You know if you're going to get deep deep into the Tantra for instance you need to learn Sanskrit. If you're going to get deep into particularly the folk levels of Taoist magic you're certainly going to have to learn you know one of those languages maybe Mandarin Chinese. So the initiatic path is hard enough without actually setting yourself you know extra obstacles to mm -hmm. overcome. So I, I chose the tradition that was closest to me culturally which is the runes and um, I had some experience of them through chaos magic and through working with people in the IOT like for instance through the IOT I became friends with Ian Reid who was running the British section from 1991 to 93 when 93 was when I became the section head and um, Ian was also active in the Rune Guild which was really quite a small organisation at the time there was uh, well it's still fairly small all initiatic organisations are by their nature but uh, he yeah he, he, he was one of the, the people that, that got into that early and stuck stuck with it and of course now he's um, uh, one of the main leaders administrators for Europe in that organisation um, and 
I, I realised there was some real depth in that tradition, in that so-called northern tradition, <clears throat> but also that it was something that was much more approachable because, I mean, you know, we speak English, which is a, a Germanic language, basically. So you've already got, you know, part of your soul already resonates with those mysteries through the language. Um, so, yeah, that, that was, and in 1996, I, um, well, I, I'd started before that. I, I made myself a set of Elder Fudark runes mm -hmm. and um, meditated on each one for a day and carved it and so forth. So I, for 20, so I did it for 24 days. And then three years after that, I kind of went through that whole process again in more detail when I started doing the Nine Doors of Midgard, which is the curriculum for the Rune Guild. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so I plunged into that and spent the next few years completely absorbed in it. Excuse me. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting, especially f found the part where you were talking about paradigm shifting and becoming unsatisfactory after a while and wanting to go into something a lot more deeper. That's of course been, been my own experience. And while, while it's great to have an experience of lots of different types of magic, and it gives you a very well-rounded um, magical education. Going into one thing very deeply um, can be extremely satisfying. Absolutely, I would strongly recommend anybody who's who's come into magic the way that I did, and probably you did, through chaos magic. You know, and that the, those multi-model perspectives are incredibly good and very, very important for your mental health in this age as well. Um, but I would strongly advise um, after a few years of that to start studying a, a tradition in depth, yeah. So when I first started doing magic with runes in a group setting, initially I became a little bit confused and that's because I was working with the Anglo-Saxon Futhark and everybody else was using the Elder. So could you, could you explain a little bit about the different types of runic systems? Yeah, um, there's three that are important to the working magician, I think, or some would say four. There's the Elder Fudar, which is kind of somewhere around the first, second century of the Pomp era. Then there's the Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Frisian Fudar, which is about three centuries later, when you've already got a layer of Christianization in the, um, in the British Isles. Then you've got uh, a couple of centuries after that, you've got the beginning of the evolution of the younger Fruvark, or some people call the Viking runes, the Viking row, um, because it correlates with that the sort of Viking era. Um, those are the three important ones to my mind. There's also um, a 19th century one called the Armanan Fruvark, which is um, an extraordinary thing. It's 18. It's 18 runes and they're based on um, the 18 powers that Odin declares that he's got in the Havamal. Um, so there is kind of a bit of traditional background to them. They're not just made up out of thin air, but they I've never been terribly attracted to those. I've studied the older ones. Um, I think if you come into the runes in the English speaking world, you're very, very likely to start with the older Fulark, unlike you starting with the Anglo-Frisian, the Anglo-Saxon. Mm -hmm. um, most people seem to start with the older. If you come into in on continental Europe, you're, you're quite likely to start with the Armanan, actually, because um, that's um, it was just what was published, what was available at the time, mm -hmm. basically. But uh, yeah, so the, the, the three that I know, I can't speak of the Armanan really, but the other three I can I know a bit about. The Elder Fudark is where I started. Um, it's got, it's 24 runes, and so it's got a beautiful symmetry. You can kind of break it up into, I actually got one stock on the wall somewhere I used to have, I might have moved it and taken it somewhere else for some other purpose. I drew them as a kind of mandala, um, because you you know if you have a mandala with eight points, mm -hmm. but like a chaos sphere, funnily enough, mm -hmm. you can write you can write them all round there, and you go sort of like um, Fehu uh, through to Wunyo is the first mm -hmm. eight, the first eight. I'm, um, we'll get onto talking about this in a bit, I expect, and then you can write the you know the second eight round the same circle of eight and the third eight. So there's a beautiful symmetry. Um, it's a very aesthetically satisfying through the arc, and um, 
there's a lot written about it, so it's kind of quite easy to, to boot up as a working magical system. And I think most people find that. The Anglo-Saxon fugant that you started with is one that I've worked with to some extent. I made a set of Anglo-Saxon runes to learn more about it a few years back. And I did a few divinations with them and so forth, and just basically got to know my way around the system. But it it didn't grab me that much, probably because it's got it's got a funny feeling of, you know, so you've, you've got the old, basically it's the older food arc plus some. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it's either plus five or nine runes, depending on how, you know, depending on the version you look at. It's plus a few runes anyway, so it could be 29 or 32 or whatever. Yeah, it's either five or eight, I don't think. And so what you've got there, big pardon, it, I think it is nine actually, because um, I think one of the people that's made the most sense out of this transition is Nigel Pennick, who's a very delightful writer, very, very learned. Uh, where's his learning likely and is a, a, a very readable author so I definitely recommend his stuff and he is is also an artist so he's got a very good visual kind of like grasp of, of the tradition and how it how it's embedded in our culture and what remains of our older culture in this country and he um, he says that the the Anglo-Saxon food arc has had an extra air stock on and then it's had an extra rune stuck on, which might be the beginning of another ayat. So he sees it as a sort of almost like a spiral that's growing. Um, I think if you can live with that process of growth, having been kind of cut off at some point in the early Middle Ages, then that's fine. But I you know since you've got a complete cosmology or you know as a chaos magician might call it a psychocosm in the elder food arc i'm not sure what you need the extra rooms for in a way you know it's like okay let's we'll keep sticking extra rooms on and there each of them might be a refinement of an idea that's not that's probably contained in seed form in the elder food arc but it's but it's probably also a thing in itself but anyway puzzling about all that kind of put me off it a bit and um, even though I have used it, in fact, I, the only rune stone I've ever carved, a small one, which is in our front garden, mm -hmm. I did it in, um, in Anglo-Saxon runes because I wanted the message to be in English. And of course, they're the natural runes for writing English in. If you're going to write, if you're going to write any words in the older food, I guess, to be in Proto-Germanic, if you're going to write any words in the younger food arc, it's going to have to be in Old Norse. So but if you want to write words in English on an inscription, it's really got to be the... Uh, the um, Anglo-Saxon food arc. So I have worked with it a bit and I acknowledge its usefulness, but it isn't my main my main working tool. The younger food arc is something I've, I've got to grips with recently. I taught it myself um, as a sort of side thing when I was doing the Nine Doors curriculum. I sort of thought, well, I don't know anything about the younger food arc, so I'll just teach it myself. And um, I, I've got quite a strong sort of kinesthetic learning thing. So if I if I do movements or postures, it helps me learn something. So I did every day. I did um, I added a rune. So the first day I would do you know fe, and the second day I would do ur, third day thurs, and so on. And you know, and, or rather, it was like the third day I would do fe or thurs until I got to day sixteen. I could do all sixteen as flowing series of movements. And so I learned it that way. So it was strongly embedded in me from an early time. But I didn't really use it magically until uh, the last couple of years, last few years. I've been sort of I started off sort of dabbling with it. And then I thought to get really deep into this, what I need to do is to write a rune poem of it. I've written a rune poem of my um, of the older food art from my Nine Doors work. I've uh, never written a rune poem for the Anglo-Saxon. I decided to write a rune poem for the younger. And I thought this will also put me in a very unusual um, category, you know, a very unusual Venn diagram circle because nobody writes younger food art rune poems. I think there might be one other in existence apart from the traditional one. So, um, whereas dozens of people have written modern elder food art rune poems, at least certainly you know most of the rune guild um, masters and you know fellows have um, so um, I started you know I kind of printed out all the ideas I'd got so far from my notes and so I like made printed sheets of them and put them down in my sort of creative deep thinking area which is by the bed you know get ideas and half asleep and write them down things like that 
And after a couple of months, nothing much happened. I hadn't really got any further with it. So I thought I need to do a magical retirement here. I need to actually do what I did with um, the elder Fudok and contemplate one rune per day for 16 days and make a set and make notes of my impressions as I meditate and then later on make um, and write the poem. I'll show you the, uh, the rune set I made. Yeah, so this is the set I made um, in about a year ago actually, oh, right. about May last year. So uh, nice little little slips, traditional styly done in um, you know, a bit of uh, ash wood and then um, coloured and then with linseed oil to seal the surface. So that was a fun thing. So, it, but it took me months more to finish the poem. That was much harder than making the runes. I made a rune a day, um, but eventually I did it and it will be published in a collection of rune poems later this year, hopefully. I believe it, you know, it's been accepted for that collection, which is a couple of people in the Rune Guild are putting together um, collections and commentaries on rune poems. So it's that's a weird one. Why has it only got 16 runes? And that's kind of like, oh, two thirds of 24. Ooh. But no, they haven't taken an ayat out. What they've done is they've shortened the ayats and made them, but there's still three ayats. So it's a bit strange and it's been, it's been puzzling and intriguing me for the well, last 20 years, but I finally got to grips with it. Um, why would you take a system that is so beautifully symmetrical, mm -hmm. uh, aesthetically satisfying as the older food arc and reduce it to something which cannot be turned into a mandala in the same way? It would be incomplete if you did that. It would look incomplete, it would look odd. Um, but there are patterns in there and I've written about those a bit and I will be publishing some stuff about them, maybe in the form of a course on my Kaotopia School of Magic. Um, there's quite a lot of work to do and I've got a lot of other courses to write before that. But I, I did a lot of videos of myself while I was carving the runes and contemplating the room, walking about and looking at trees and all sorts. So it's kind of like, um, that is quite possible. I could do a video based course. But yeah, I, but so I don't want to get into really nitpicking detail about what I discovered for myself there. Um, but there is there is a kind of symmetry in there. It's subtler and odder because you're moving instead of each section, each out, each third of the um, of the whole row being eight. It's the first one is six, and then the second one is five, and the third one is five. So yes, the symmetry is odd. What's happened is that they've collapsed. All the meanings that were in the older food arc are still in the younger food arc, but they're, sometimes they've loaded more of them into a given room. So for instance, Urus picks up more meanings. Um, Madra, um, which is similar to Manaz, picks up more meanings. And so it's got a delightful compactness in the end. And that always struck me as being something that of people that were engaged in a in a diaspora, a massive expansion of their territory, so the Viking era is the case, might have done that. There are all sorts of reasons why they did it as well. There were changes in linguistics that made some of the phonemes, the actual sounds that correspond to the older food are kind of useless for the people of that age because the language had shifted over the centuries. Um, so they, you know, so that there's all sorts of linguistic reasons for that. But of course, the, re the deeper reason is bound to be magical because this is something that was actually composed, almost certainly composed by one person or a small number of people. In, uh, yeah, and then and, and spread out over a large territory. But there's something about a diaspora culture about it. It's, it's, it's like, a, like a, a compact toolkit that you can pick up and some of the runes that are missing seem significant like for instance the final rune in the older food arc Ophala, one of the meanings of which is homeland and these people had kind of lost their homeland you know they were because of the excesses of the uh, Norwegian royalty a lot of the aristocracy and uh, warrior caste had sort of left the country and colonized Iceland and then moved on to Greenland and North America and so forth and these people basically couldn't go back they couldn't go, they couldn't easily go back to Norway. So there's something about having lost your homeland there. So I think that might be a bit of a subtext in the in the contraction of the whole thing. But there's something very vital about it. I'm really enjoying using it for magic at the moment. 
that's a long answer to your question. Yes, that's fantastic. <laughs> You've talked a, a little bit about the um, about the AETs. Could you explain a little bit more about what you mean by that? Okay. Well, the the term is really most meaningful when applied to the Elder Fudark. Um, Elder Fudark is 24. It divides very neatly into three. Mm -hmm. So the first rune of the first ayat is Fehu, and you Fehu orders Thuristhal's answers, Waibo, Kainaz, Gebo, Wunio, and that's your first eight. Mm -hmm. um, so that's your first ayat, eight ayat, mm -hmm. if you pronounce it. And then the second ayat starts with um, Hagalaz, Hagalaz now is Isa, Yera, and so on. And then the third ayat starts with Tiwaz, Tiwaz, Berkonol, Echwaz, Manaz, and so on. So you've got this, you've got, and there are properties in common between the firsts of each of those three airs. So there are properties in common between Fehu, Hagalaz and Tiwaz. They're the head runes of each mm -hmm. air. And similarly, the you know, in, in the second position, there'll be some resonances. And this is something that's quite an interesting contemplation to do if you're digging deep down into the structure of the Elder Fuzart. One of the things you can do is look at the resonances um, jump, you know, so look at the resonances between Uras and what's the second one in the second day out now there's so look at the resonances between orders and now there's and so on um why are they like that well people have come up with all sorts of reasons as to why they were divided up like that i don't think there's any definitive answer i mean we've got a lot of inscribed rune stones and runic artifacts that run back you know, for the last 2000 years. So we've got actually the, the runic tradition is fairly well preserved in some respects. But you have to bear in mind that the runes were the first writing for the old Germanic peoples. And so you, you haven't got a magical system that lands in an existing literate culture. You have a culture that becomes literate as a result of adopting, as a result of creating a magical system, which is also a system of writing. So you don't really have any commentaries, not until you get to the Christianization, where you've got the kind of like scribe culture. You know, people like um, Snorri Sturluson in Iceland, who's like um, a priest, but he's also still immersed in the old magic and he's so he's writing commentaries and so forth and that's the 13th century or 12th 13th century somewhere around there so it's centuries later so going so going back to the origin of these food arts you've got no commentaries we don't know why these things are but there's some good theories and um i personally i see the three arts of the older food arc as having something to the first art is kind of cosmic so you start off with um, fire flashing out, vapor, it's like just a flash and it's gone. Orders, you've got structure. So you've got energy and form in the first two. And then you move on to Thurisaz, which is kind of like mindless force. It's just pure force. And then you've got the first rune, which represents consciousness after that answers. So they're kind of like paired exactly opposites but complementary pairs and you've got an evolution in time and the f so the first out I see as cosmic the second out as a bit more personal so it's more to do with um, personal responses to the way the world changes um, and the third out is is more to do with a process a series of initiatory processes it's I can't really justify that in great detail and you know certainly not um, unless we're gonna you know let me sit and ramble for a long time but that's basically my idea of it and I think other people do share a similar idea but there are other ideas as well so we don't really know the short answer. Thank you and one of, one of my favorite ways of working with runes is waterfall galza I wonder if you could explain a bit about your experiences of this. It's amazing, isn't it? It's mm. a, my favourite ways of getting high is singing with other people. It's just a fabulous thing. In about 1999, I was driving down the motorway for some event. I live in the north of England. I was driving down for some event in London. And um, actually, I was living in London at the time briefly. But, um, and I had Radio 4 on. There was some programme about 
what they describe as waterfall singing in Scottish churches. And um, there were some recordings from a church on the Isle of Lewis. And um, these, you know, in the cultural fringes, like when you're right out in the cultural fringes where things haven't changed for centuries, you get the most interesting survivals. And these people use a singing technique in church, which is considered to be a survival of one of the oldest singing styles known in Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's a really ancient singing style. And basically, your big man in the church stands up and they start doing a psalm. So he'll sing a, a line of a psalm and he'll introduce maybe two, three, four notes, a simple tune. And then other people pick up on it after he's done that. Other people pick up on it, male and female voices, and they weave in together, listening to each other. But what you end up with is this torrent of sound. It sort of makes it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up to hear it. It's, it's phenomenal. There are discs available of this. This um, uh, Gallic Psalms from the Isle of Lewis. If you Google that, you'll find an existing CD, which I bought a few years ago. There was nothing that I could find at the time, but something has come out since then. The voices tumble over each other. You're not aiming necessarily for harmony, but you're aiming to listen and somehow fit your voice in with what's already been sung. And I thought, I was like in the car and thinking, God, I've got to do this with runes. This is it. This is the way to sing runes in groups. This is it. So I started developing that. And, um, you know, in, in IoT groups and people loved it and we all loved it. And I think my my peak experience that I can remember was at uh, a meeting in Austria in about 07, is that um, we, the Austrian set people, had, uh, um, for this meeting had rented, us, rented a, a temple which had an underground section. It was a hexagonal temple with an underground section and this, and this sort of then a, a ground floor section. So you're in this kind of like pit this beautiful floor and there's this ground floor section and then there's you know through a hole you can see um a s gla glass and wood the whole ceiling consisted of glass and wood and it's in the form of a snowflake haggar room you know the sort of young <laughs> dark allies and, uh, and we had the full moon shining through it and we just sang and sang and sang and it just it still makes my skin tingle to think to remember back to that event um and um, yes, there's some real peak experiences to be had in Waterfall Galda. I suspect that from what we know, quite a lot of rune singing will probably have been done solo. But if they did ever sing in groups back in the, the older days, then I wouldn't be surprised if they used a technique like that. It certainly works and it sounds just right. And I can say one of my peak experiences has uh, been with Waterfall Galda. And I actually think that it was a ritual that you were running. And there was around 45, maybe 50 people in the room doing Waterfall Galza. And mm. I, I was still relatively new to runes at this point. And after a while, I, ha I started to have this sensation that I wasn't singing the runes. The runes were actually singing me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I then felt the runes as actual living entities in their own right. You know, not just marks on sticks you do a divination with. And there were a lot more than that. And that these were actually spirits that I was communicating with. And what, what's, what's your experience of that? That's a really nice way of putting it. I'm not sure that I've experienced them as conscious entities in that sense of spirits. Um, in the sense of, for instance, you know, goetic spirits or angels or anything like that. But um they're very much alive very much living living like so almost like living forces in my in my cosmology you know rather than actual conscious beings um yes they, they seem to have their own independent existence out there they seem to be parts of the universe which are just as real as um you know as as any conscious spirit you've worked with and uh, they're almost like an inner architecture that can be projected outwards, like a living inner architecture, like great soaring, you know, for forest built halls of sound kind of thing. Oh, by the way, before I forget, uh, maybe we can sort of add this on at the end. I've got, uh, just in case you didn't, didn't pick up on this, I did a, 
Um, I did a blog post on Waterfall Galva with some recordings. I'll give you a link for that. Um, this is a few months back. Yeah. Oh, that'd be fantastic. It's, what, it's definitely one of my favourite things to do with the runes. Mm. Um, while I don't have a very powerful singing voice myself, it still feels right to sing them. <laughs> yes, I know what you mean. You don't have to be. You don't have to be a good a good singer in the sense mm -hmm. of you know being able to sing, being able to sort of like really, really, really carry a tune or something. Um, but you, um, it's. it's you know, just listen to what other people are singing and join in with appropriate enthusiasm and the mm -hmm. results will be awesome, yeah. <laughs> well, I was informed once by somebody who was standing right next to me while I was um, doing the Galza, that actually during the Galza I had perfect pitch. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Your heart was in it and so, you you know, a new layer of skill emerged. Yeah, but only when I'm singing runes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for um, sharing your, your knowledge with us. That was fantastic. And we'll definitely look into some of the um, websites and books you've pointed us to. Okay, yeah. Oh, it's been a pleasure.